Welcome. In today's lesson, we're going to begin the study of the book of James. I'm really excited about that because James is one of my very favorite books in the Bible, and it's especially one of my favorite books to have a small group Bible study on because the book of James is perhaps the most practical book in the Bible. Almost every verse, every passage inside this book is packed with practical truths that can transform your life. As you probably know, James was the one that said, faith without works is dead. So the lessons in this book are primarily geared from James to the saints of the church to encourage them to live out their faith in daily life. There is certainly some doctrinal points inside, but the primary focus of James is on how to obey God. That's a very exciting thing for us to approach, especially being from study and obey as we are seeking to study God's passage and obey it one verse at a time. So before we get into today's passage, let's go ahead and read James 1, 1 through 11. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So the book of James is written, guess what, by James. So there are two possible candidates, though, as to who this James is. One is James, the brother of John, and one is James, the oldest and half-brother of Jesus. Now, James, the brother of John, was martyred in the very, very early history of the New Testament church, probably too early to have written this book, leaving James, Jesus' half-brother, as the author. Now, this is quite interesting because James originally rejected his brother Jesus as being the Messiah. But evidently, he trusted in him after seeing Jesus resurrected. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 7 tells us that Jesus actually appeared to James after his resurrection. So James was then an associate of the apostles and a key leader in the Jerusalem church. This letter, it says, is written to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. So it's primarily geared toward Jewish believers who are scattered around the Roman Empire. Perhaps some of this persecution was the very persecution that killed the James, the half-brother of John. And when this persecution started under Herod Agrippa, the Jewish believers then began scattering around uh, many places in the world. And so this book is very Jewish in nature and contains frequent references to the Old Testament. This epistle is mostly focused on practical Christian living as opposed to theoretical knowledge or doctrines. It focuses on day-to-day -day life, relationship, and applications in the world around us. So its first aim seems to be to encourage believers to live godly lives, to live out their faith. So let's go ahead and get into the main points of James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. This is one of the most famous verses in the Bible about the purpose of trials. And the main teaching of this verse here is that trials are meant for our good. They're meant to 
test our faith. They give us a chance to prove our love for God in action. Now, many times it's easy for us to say we love God. We go to church on Sunday and we sing praise songs to Jesus, telling Him how much we love Him. That is easier to do when things are going easily in our life. But what about when things become difficult? These are the times that really require faith and show our true character. So this testing of our faith is not so that God will know whether our faith is legitimate or not. If you think back on one of the first tests of faith when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, this was not a test so that God could find out if Abraham really had enough faith to do this or not. Of course, God knows everything. But this test ended up benefiting Abraham because it revealed to Abraham the nature of his own faith. After that situation, Abraham could remember back to that and saw that his faith passed the test, and this would give him more confidence moving forward that he would continue to obey God no matter how challenging that might be. In Romans five three to four, Paul says, "Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope." So it's during challenging times like this that the rubber meets the road. We have two choices on how to go forward. We can respond in faith, which then means、uh, it will produce perseverance and character and hope in our life. And God will use these trials to refine us and make us more like Him. But at the same time, Satan wants to use those very trials. To turn our attention away from God, to get us to doubt God's goodness, to get us, if even possible, to give up our faith in Him. So Satan may want to use the very situation that God wants to use for good in our life to tempt us and draw us away from Him, as the case with Job. Satan wanted Job to curse God and move on with it. So. It's helpful for us when we face trials to always come back to this truth: God wants to use this trial in your life for good, whatever trial it is you are facing. And I want you to think for a moment about a trial that you may be facing. Perhaps it is sickness or disease. Perhaps it's long-term chronic pain. Perhaps it is、uh, a difficult situation in your job or in your family. Now I want you to think for about that specific trial just for a moment, and remember that God is good. Remember that God wants to use that very trial in your life to produce character in you. He wants you to grow to be more like Him through that trial. So spend some time in prayer. Even now, you can push pause for a moment and pray to God, and tell Him. That you are thankful for that trial in your life, and then ask him also to reveal the good that he intends that trial to produce in your life, so that you can learn the lesson that he has in mind for you. James also says, "Consider it pure joy, or count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet a trial." This is the mindset that James encourages his readers to have. Trials are certainly not enjoyable, are they? So how can we say, "Oh, yay, a trial"? James doesn't mean, "Oh, you should be happy or you should celebrate." If, for example, there's the death of a loved one in your family, he's not saying be happy about it, but he is saying, even in the midst of that trial, recognize God's goodness in that situation. Recognize that God has a plan to bring about good from this bad. Situation in your life, so know the truth of the matter, and believe in God, believe in His goodness, and believe that God wants to use this to build up your character. And when you know that truth and claim it and believe it, you can respond to that trial with joy. So trials test our faith and develop perseverance. We know that God has our best interests at heart. So when we face these trials, we should always try to look at them from the perspective 
of the question, what is God trying to teach me through this trial? Now, it is also possible that if you don't look at it that way and you don't learn the lesson God has for you, the trial may keep coming and coming and coming, perhaps as long as it takes until you get that lesson, until you learn it. So, for example, I can think of a situation in my life. I was praying for more patience. And when you pray for patience, God might send someone into your life to help you develop patience. My wife and I gave our first daughter the middle name Patience. We wanted her to be a patient person. And so we wanted to use her name as she grew older to remind her that God wants her to be patient. Little did we know that perhaps God had another plan in mind when we named her this. So of all of our children, she was the most colicky. For months and months and months, she would cry all during the day if we didn't hold her. If we held her, then everything was good. But if we put her down to go do some work, then she would start crying. So we realized at some point during this process that God wanted to use her in our life to develop patience, to teach us patience. So now we actually have a great testimony and a great story related to her name. Not something that we intended, but something God used. God used this difficult situation in our life where our nerves were getting frayed and it caused stress and so on. But he used this situation to develop in us patience so that we are better able to handle stressful or challenging situations later on in our life. Trials are like this. At the time, they're not enjoyable. But God uses them to teach us lessons and to help us grow. We did learn to be more patient and still have some of those same lessons with us today. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So for an application, you can think, what are some practical ways you can have joy in the midst of a trial? This verse in 1 Peter tells us that we are to rejoice, just like this verse in the book of James, because the trials are only for a little while. They are short term. But the good God brings from the trials are eternal and are meant to improve you and your relationship to Christ for all of eternity. So this teaches us a lesson about God, that God cares more about your long-term character than he does about your short-term comfort. So we need to think of how we can respond to trials with joy. Perhaps one way is to come to God in prayer more often and look for the good in that trial and thank God for it. And then memorize verses like these, which remind us God has a good purpose even in the midst of that. Now, James also says, he says, when you face many kinds of trials or meet trials of various kinds, trials come in all shapes and sizes. We are not only to have a good attitude in certain kinds of trials, specifically ones that are maybe not so difficult or more short term. We are to have joy even in the midst of very difficult trials or trials that go on for a very long time. Paul, for example, had a thorn in the flesh. He prayed three times for God to remove this thorn. He said, this is difficult, it's challenging for me. Can you take away this thorn, this trial, whatever it was in his life? But God did not remove it. And later Paul realized that God gave him this thorn to teach him humility. And he learned the lesson that God's grace is perfected in his own weaknesses. So there may be many different kinds of trials that you could face. Trials in your job, financial trials, Trials of difficult relationships in your family. Trials of health. All different kinds of trials you might 
face. But remember, even in the midst of that, God's goodness and His care and His love for you. Now, it might be that you are listening to this lesson today and thinking, "I don't have that many trials in my life." That is great. That is also something to be thankful for. But perhaps there's someone around you, maybe a family member or a friend, who you know is facing difficult trials. I would also encourage you. In mind with today's lesson, to go to that person to express your care and encouragement for them and pray for them. Maybe God wants to use you in their life to encourage them in the midst of a trial that they are facing. So then James says, "You know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness." And then verse four, "Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing." Lacking in nothing, so God wants to use this child to make you mature and complete, to help you grow in your Christian life. God does not tr- just take trials away from our life and give us a smooth life because that would not be beneficial for us. Imagine a child who grew up in a pampered, spoiled situation. He gets everything he wants immediately. He never faces challenges because his parents immediately step in to solve those problems for him. How will the child end up? He will grow up spoiled, right? Then, when he leaves home and a real trial hits, he may have no idea what to do, and he may go off the deep end. The last emperor of China was a man named Pu Yi. He had servants who did everything for him. They even brushed his teeth, and they tied his shoes. They brought him food. He didn't have to do anything for himself. He lived an extremely spoiled existence. Partially because of this, he grew up to be very selfish and even sadistic, delighting to torture the palace servants. He cared nothing for others. So when he became a man, he faced trials, and he had no. Moral character and no backbone. He ended up betraying his people and his country. This was about the time of World War II. A few trials growing up may have helped him produce at least some kind of character that he wouldn't be so focused on himself. Now the Lord wants to bring us to maturity slowly and surely. So think for a moment now about a trial in your life. Maybe a trial you're facing now. Maybe something you faced in the past. And I'd like you to think about that and even write down this trial, and then ask yourself, what did God want to teach me in the midst of this trial? What lesson did I learn? Think about that for a moment. Reflect and write down the lesson that you learned, and then thank God and say, God, I. Even at that time, perhaps this trial was difficult, but now I realize what you wanted to teach me in the midst of it. Thank you that you let me face that trial because you taught me this important lesson about your character or about your word. So there are two responses we can have when we face a trial. We can respond to it with joy and with faith and grow and persevere even when it's difficult, or we can. Grow perhaps、uh, doubtful about God's goodness, or we can think this is too difficult, and we can slowly drift away from God. Let us make the decision today that no matter what trial we face, we will persevere and push forward to serve Him. Moving forward to the next section in our passage today, we'll start with verse five. It says, "If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all." Without reproach, and it will be given him. True wisdom comes from God and not ourselves. The world offers the appearance of wisdom, but only when you look at things through temporal eyes. Now, God wants you to succeed. He wants us to follow His will and to make the right decision. So, God will give us true wisdom from Him when we ask Him to. The problem is sometimes we don't want it. In fact, we all lack wisdom quite often. 
the first test is to see if we admit it or not. Now, a prideful person seldom likes asking the opinion of others. He thinks that he perhaps knows everything, so he doesn't need to ask others for their advice or their opinion. He thinks he can solve problems on his own with his own logic. A prideful believer does the same thing. He seldom prays because he thinks he can handle it on his own with his own intelligence. But when we're humble, when we see ourselves as God sees us, we see how weak and how small we are, and we realize there are many variables that we don't understand that we can't control. We realize how little we know, and we'll be motivated to turn to the Lord in. Prayer. So God, He will give generously and without finding fault. This phrase "without finding fault" is quite interesting. He seems to be saying God won't blame you for your lack of knowledge. Now, a child may ask his parents a question about his homework, and sometimes the parent might say, "Why are you asking me that? You should already know the answer. What's your problem?" That's the wrong attitude, of course. Now God is saying. And、James is saying about God here that God won't answer us in that way. He won't blame us for our lack of knowledge. Rather, He will welcome it when we come to Him seeking His wisdom. Proverbs three five through seven says, "Trust the Lord with all your heart; lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your path straight." Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. Don't trust in your own wisdom. We need wisdom in all kinds of situations. What job should I take? What person should I marry? How should I raise my children in an increasingly dark world and culture? How do I answer the question of my Bible study student from God's Word? We have so many situations we need wisdom in. Let us make a regular habit of coming to God in prayer. Whenever we face those situations in our life, we can have a healthy lifestyle of prayer. We immediately take a moment and pray and come to God. And we can also model the same for our children. If our ch- child is having difficulty in his homework. And struggling, wanting to give up, we can say, "Let's pray about that, and let's ask God to give wisdom in this situation." And then it says, "He must believe and not doubt." Do we really believe God can and will answer our prayers? Do we really believe He's listening? Do we really believe that He is all powerful and all good? If we are coming to God in prayer, we must believe. Those things; these are questions we must ask and we must solve before we approach Him in prayer. We should then pray confidently, knowing He hears every word we speak and He will answer according to what is good for us. Hebrews eleven six says, "And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists." And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We must have faith when we come to God in prayer. Now, his answer may not be exactly what we want or what we hope for. Just as a parent does not always give the child what they ask for, but his answer will be exactly what is good for us and exactly what we need. A child might ask his parent for ice cream, and he thinks that ice cream is indeed good for him. But a parent probably knows better about the health situation of the kid and the nutrition of the food, and so the parent might say, "No, you can't have it." The child may not understand in that moment. Why don't you give it to me? It's good. But the parent knows best, and sometimes he says no for the good of the child. The same with God in prayer. He will give you what is good for you according to His infinite and perfect knowledge. So this is not a magic formula for getting whatever we want in prayer. You cannot force God to do something against His will just by believing it. And in the end, 
we can really only have this this faith if we know it is God's will. So we know, in fact, from this passage, it is God's will to give us wisdom when we lack it. So for this issue, we can come to Him in complete faith that He will do what He says. The last passage in our text today is in verses nine eleven about being humble and content. James says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So although a person's economic position might be poor, his position in Christ is high. He may be physically poor, but spiritually rich. Those who are poor in this world should not focus on their lack of material things. Rather, they should focus on their abundant spiritual blessings. In Revelation 2, 9, Jesus was writing to the church of Smyrna, and he said, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Rich. So, This riches is not a guarantee of financial prosperity or material blessings, but it's that even in the midst of your economically difficult situation, God will bless you with meaning and purpose and joy, eternal life, the indwelling of the Spirit. You are rich in Christ as the child of God. Verses 10 and 11 tells us that the rich person should realize that in the end, he's just like a poor person. His riches will fade away. His life itself will be as short as many of the poor people who are around him. Riches cannot buy long life. People try. They hope that their riches can do so. They They spend a lot of money to try to live longer and longer lives, and perhaps they can extend their lives to some extent. But in the end, every person...